My name is Diane DeRigo. I'm the Radioactive Waste Project Director at Nuclear Information and Resource Service. We're a Washington, D.C.-based uh, organization that focuses on nuclear power, nuclear waste, and radiation issues. Of the different kinds of radioactive waste that result from nuclear power, there's a category that's called low-level radioactive waste. And some of this so-called low-level waste can give a lethal dose in 20 minutes if you're exposed unshielded. So in some ways, that's really a misnomer. However, uh, that's the catch-all category for everything but the irradiated fuel, the really hot stuff that comes from the core of the nuclear power reactor. That can give a lethal dose in just a few seconds or minutes. So. Where does the waste go? There is nowhere for it to go that will guarantee isolation from the environment for as long as it's hazardous. This waste is hazardous for in the hundreds to thousands to millions of years. And we don't have institutions or structures that we know will last that can isolate the waste for all that time. So what we do is give sacrifice areas, uh, choose sacrifice areas to store the material until something comes along and we pass it on to future generations in a way that hopefully they will be able to manage it and make the right decisions. The radioactive waste that's generated from nuclear power and from nuclear weapons um, has traditionally gone into unlined soil ditches. There's been a big promotion recently by the nuclear industry uh, touting the fact that they think that nuclear power is the answer to the climate change crisis because it doesn't emit greenhouse gas. So what would you say to that? Nuclear power, nuclear power will make the climate crisis worse because putting money into nuclear power is going to delay putting it into real answers. The real answers are energy efficiency and renewable energy and more intelligent use of our um, electricity and our energy systems. Nuclear power is not the answer to the climate problems because it will create long-lasting radioactive material for which there's no solution. Nuclear waste is generated from nuclear power, nuclear waste that lasts for hundreds of thousands to millions of years. If people understood that nuclear power routinely emits ionizing radiation at every step of the fuel chain, from mining to milling to uh, conversion and concentrating the fuel and forming the fuel and putting it in the reactor and running the reactor at every step of the way, radioactive materials are released into the air and the water and wastes are generated. All that can cause cancer, can cause other terrible health effects, and that these carcinogens, these wastes, are going to last for literally millions of years, we would put our energy into finding other ways to have to create energy or to use our energy more wisely it's going to be easy for us easier for us to use our human energy to figure out a way to get through this energy crisis without nuclear power than it will be to try to solve the nuclear waste problem nuclear waste is the real achilles heel of the nuclear power industry uh, the current plan is to try to pretend that some of it's not radioactive and send it into regular garbage dumps and literally sell it into recycling and make it into everyday items like your belt buckle, your frying pan, your baby toys, um, the cars, the furniture. They're trying to put nuclear waste into everyday consumer goods, uh, sell it instead of isolate it. In order to have nuclear power, Uranium has to be mined from the ground, ground up and milled, um, concentrated in the uranium-235 and separating out the uranium-238 and the 234 and the stuff that's called depleted uranium, which is still very toxic, uh, radioactive, hazardous, and long-lasting. It's called depleted only because the uranium-235s atoms have been removed and so it's depleted in the isotope that is used to fission or to split to make nuclear energy and nuclear weapons but uh, it's still a problem at each of those steps the mining the milling the 
concentrating of the fuel, the conversion of it to a gas, the concentration and then the reconversion back to a solid, the making of the fuel, putting it into the nuclear power reactor. There are radioactive emissions into the air, into the water. Workers get exposed. Solid wastes are generated. Liquids and sludges at different points are generated. And many of these have radioactivity that will be literally hazardous and radioactively toxic for millions of years. So if people understood that that's what it takes to run a nuclear reactor, that it means mining and then transporting and then taking many other steps in order just to create the fuel, and then the fuel itself, when it goes into the reactor, it is uranium mainly, when it comes out, it's millions of times more radioactive. The nuclear power industry likes to call it spent fuel. It's actually irradiated fuel. It is millions of times more radioactive. It can give a lethal dose in just a few seconds if you're unshielded. And it needs to be isolated for literally hundreds of thousands to millions of years because of the radioactivity that formed when those uranium atoms split. Fossil fuels are needed in order to do the mining and the milling and the transporting and the conversion. At one point in our history, in order to run the um, uranium enrichment plants, which are the ones that concentrate the uranium-235, it took several coal plants. It took a high percent of the electricity generated in the country just to make the nuclear fuel, just to concentrate the uranium-235s that could then be fabricated into little pellets, made into rods, and put into the cores of the nuclear reactors. So fossil fuels are needed, greenhouse gases are emitted, and in that step, in that enrichment step, uh, there has been emission of uh, greenhouse gases as well from the actual enrichment process. So. It's not a clean fuel as far as not uh, having a carbon footprint either. That's one misnomer. But I think for me, what's especially disturbing is touting that, yeah, when you split a uranium atom, carbon doesn't come out, but hundreds of different radioactive elements come out, all of which are pot potential carcinogens. And they are released routinely into the air and the water at what the federal regulators, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, calls acceptable emissions, uh, acceptable leak rates from nuclear dumps. What we've got is a legalization of the poisoning of the planet to enable the nuclear industry to operate. And if you knew that radioactivity was coming out from every step of the chain, if you knew that radiation was being emitted from the operation of nuclear power. You wouldn't say, oh, it doesn't give off some other poison. You've got to admit that this is a problem that needs to be faced in and of itself, and you don't substitute one poison for another, when the real answer is moving toward efficiency, moving toward renewables that really are sustainable, and changing things. We're going to have to make some changes. We might as well make changes and have clean and safe and renewable energy rather than go with the old pattern, make a lot more intense poisons that will be hazardous for a long time, perpetuate an industry that uh, feeds into proliferating of nuclear weapons, that exposes its workers to radiation routinely every single day. If you work in nuclear installations, you're going to have every day some amount of exposure to radiation. And these people take the risks themselves, but they also share them with their, genetically, with their children. And the communities are contaminated, and this stuff spreads around. The, the ideal would be to put the energy and the creativity that we have into other ways, into doable ways, ways that, uh, of making electricity that are truly renewable and sustainable. Can you talk to us about how much radioactive waste already exists and why uh, the industry would be uh, attempting to sell it? The um, 104 reactors, nuclear power reactors that have been operating in this country over the past say 40 years or so, have been generating radioactive waste all along the way. 
uh, high-level waste and the so-called low-level radioactive waste, which actually some is highly radioactive. Um, these wastes have been buried, um, the, the so-called low-level wastes have been buried in uh, unlined soil trenches. Those trenches are leaking. The government has helped the industry look for new dumps. It's been difficult. People are not willing to take million-year hazardous waste and put it into ditches that will be watched for a hundred years that have an acceptable leak rate. So they know they'll be leaking. So in the past 20 years that the nuclear industry has been looking for new dumps for this waste, uh, they have been unsuccessful. There have not been any new radioactive waste facilities built for disposing of radioactive waste um, since the uh, 60s, 70s. So the waste is building up regardless. Where is it? It's either at reactors or it's now starting to go to processors. It's actually been going to processors uh, for the last 15, 10, 15 years to be processed in order to reduce the volume and to perhaps release the radioactivity, some of the radioactivity, and um, in some cases then deregulated, declared clean enough to release, either to regular garbage dumps or to uh, recycling. So waste from nuclear power, waste from nuclear weapons that is generally less concentrated, the stuff that is not going to give you a lethal dose right away but certainly can initiate a fatal cancer, um, this stuff is also building up. Nuclear waste has been building up at reactors and at centralized uh, storage places for the entire time that nuclear reactors have been operating. There have been six permanent nuclear dumps in the country that operated for this so-called low-level radioactive waste, everything but the irradiated fuel. Four of those are closed, two are now open. Another one is open for a portion of that waste. But the nuclear industry would much prefer to deregulate or re remove regulatory control over as much of this radioactive waste as possible. It may contain plutonium, which is long-lasting. It may contain strontium, which is a bone seeker and causes bone cancer and leukemia. It may contain any of these iodines that would concentrate, radioiodines that would concentrate in the thyroid. But it's in concentrations that aren't going to give a lethal dose, so it's hard to detect. So the, the, the lower concentrated say high volume but still contaminated radioactive materials have been, uh, there have been several efforts over the decades to declare these not radioactive enough to continue to put the resources into control. There was an effort to call it below regulatory concern and remove regulatory concern from it. The public said no and the government continued to have to regulate it. Now there's uh, efforts to send the waste to processors first and then the processors determine whether or not it still needs to be regulated and they can in some cases send the waste to regular garbage. Sometimes nuclear power reactors get permission to send their waste to regular garbage. Regular garbage dumps usually eventually leak. They are only required to have institutional controls for 30 years. They have liners that are designed to stop isolating the waste after 30, 40 years. So these regular garbage dumps are not intended to isolate waste for the hundreds, thousands, and millions of years that nuclear power and weapons waste remains radioactive. You also end up with chemicals in regular garbage dumps and there can be interactions between radioactive material and chemicals. Um, sometimes chelating agents, chemicals that are used for stripping paints or uh, solvents um, are in regular landfills. These can cause radionuclides to move more quickly through the soil and out of the dumps. That's why we don't normally mix radioactive and hazardous waste together. Um, so the the nuclear waste that would go into a regular garbage dump has the possibility of making that dump much more dangerous. When it leaks, it's going to leak radioactivity. Um, the concern I have is with the long-lasting radioactivity. If it's short-lasting and it doesn't leak out um, for a few years but it's decayed, 
then it's not going to be as much of a concern. But the nuclear power and weapons industry create uh, waste that are hazardous for a long, long time, radioactive for a long, long time. So when you send nuclear waste to a regular garbage dump, you make that dump that much more hazardous. When uh, the experts are looking at climate change and saying we've got to reduce the amount of carbon uh, or greenhouse gases um, within the next 10, 20 years, we've got a limited amount of time and we've got various ways that we can cut back. If nuclear were intended to substitute for some of those uh, carbon-based fuels, it would need to come into play right away. And we don't have the ability, not that we would want to, but even if we did, we don't have the ability to build enough nuclear reactors to really make a dent, to fulfill a significant portion of the energy needs to replace carbon. In addition, in using nuclear power, we're also relying on and using a lot of carbon based fuels just to mine and mill and convert and create the fuel and then to manage the waste and to move the materials back and forth. So in and of itself, uh, within the short amount of time that we need to really take action, nuclear power cannot provide a good answer, a good solution. And in fact, any resources that we spend on nuclear are being wasted, but they're also stealing from the real answer. So we are, instead of moving to solve the problem, we're doing the opposite. We're wasting money on something that won't solve it and that keeps us from solving it. In a crisis um, where, you know, for example, um, there's some kind of natural disaster, a nuclear power plant has to be shut down at the very point when the electricity is needed. Um, and then it's going to take electricity in order to start it up again. So it's not a very reliable uh, fuel source for us. How about also um, talking about the need to keep the fuel safe uh, from, I mean, how are we going to keep it cool enough to go uh, prevent criticalities? You're you know, talking about the irradiated fuel irradiated when it comes out of a reactor and we've got so much of it already generated and there's nowhere to permanently dispose of it. We don't have a way to do that. We can pretend and put it into some location and then it will leak and we will be sacrificing that location and that's what the government's headed to when they're pushing for Yucca Mountain. But um, the best we can do with it right now is to store and recontainerize it. Uh, and why is it necessary to recontainerize it? Because the fuel is going to stay radioactive and be a hazard much longer than any containers that we can build. The, um, and then over time, the fuel is going to start falling apart, and so it's going to need to be carefully handled. Now, a real problem, and what got me off uh, into this subject in the earlier years, was um, the problem with what's called reprocessing of irradiated fuel. There are steps that can be taken when you take the irradiated fuel. It can be chopped up, put through chemical baths, and then extract out remaining uranium and plutonium that's formed with the idea of using that for other nuclear fuel, for nuclear power or weapons. But then you end up with a whole brew of very intensely radioactive high-level liquid and um, chemical waste. And the next step has been to convert that into a solid and hope that it stays solid long enough to find a place to put it. So in this country we've got high-level waste in the form of irradiated fuel from nuclear reactors. We have uh, liquid and sludge from the little bit of reprocessing that did go on uh, from 66 to uh, 72. And then we stopped doing reprocessing. Um, so we have that liquid and sludge which has now been converted into a solid and we still don't have a place to put either the fuel, uh, the liquids that are actually left from some of the weapons reprocessing that hasn't been converted to solid, and then we've got the solid 
that's been formed. So we've got the high level waste sitting in various stages, all hoping that it can go to some permanent repository somewhere. In the meantime, the expense that it takes to try to convert that liquid into a solid is more than the Department of Energy wants to pay, so they are on a, a really strong campaign to declassify that waste and pretend that it's no longer high level and call it something else, waste incidental to reprocessing, and then treat it as if it's not high level and grout it and leave it in the ground, threatening major major water systems in South Carolina, in Idaho, in Washington, and potentially in the Great Lakes in western New York, because those are the places where the, uh, the uh, reprocessing has taken place and the, the wastes are currently located. A push to start reprocessing again uh, to make the irradiated fuel, you know, to take uh, uranium and plutonium out of it, and but then we're going to have a much bigger problem because the kinds of waste that are generated from reprocessing are even more difficult to handle than the irradiated fuel and more expensive and more worker exposures and more routine releases into the air and water and the six years of reprocessing that took place already in this country at West Valley, New York it's projected to cost five billion dollars to clean up that mess and we in New York State are in a major fight with the state of New York and the Department of Energy to clean it up and not leave it there and let it leak into the Great Lakes and poison the western New York and the Great Lakes aquifers. Uh, is it possible to really clean this stuff up? Well, all we can do with radioactive waste is try to gather it together and keep track of it. We can't dispose of it. There's no a way to throw it away. Uh, wherever it goes, it's going to leak out unless it's routinely monitored and recontainerized. So putting it into disposal is a myth, uh, but it's, it has to be dealt with. You can't leave it there because of entropy. You know, it's going to dissipate, it's going to spread. So, and we know over time that it's going to get more and more expensive. So the sooner that it's uh, dug up and collected and gathered and put into institutional controls and technical conditions that can be managed, the better. The cheaper it will be in the long run. When nuclear waste is put into containers, um, even if it is pretty inert and it doesn't attack the container, the containers are going to degrade over time. Um, if it's in uh, an environment that has other chemicals or has stressors on it, then that will accelerate the destruction of the container. Which is why the general gist, the general push has been for monitored and retrievable and institutionally controlled uh, management of nuclear waste. Of course, that's a lot more expensive than throwing it in a ditch and saying in a hundred years we don't have to watch it anymore. So it's taking a lot of effort to push to just take the waste that's already been created over the 40 or 50 years that we've had nuclear electricity and manage that waste. We're nowhere near knowing how to take care of all that waste. We've got leaking dumps in six or eight different places just from commercial nuclear power waste, not to mention the sites themselves. It's the height of audacity to, say, to ignore that and to come back and say we want to make more of it and we want to have a higher reliance on it in the future. It's immoral and it's technically um, not doable. The only way that it can be justified is to ignore or deny the danger of the radioactivity. And what we know from even the most conservative scientific bodies is that there's no safe dose of ionizing radioactivity. That any amount increases a, per increases a person's risk of getting cancer, a fatal cancer. It's now associated, radioactivity is now associated with um, heart disease, with reduced immunity, with birth defects, with uh, childhood cancers. Uh, Babies are now being born with cancer. It's a very difficult world we're living in. To deliberately add to it by allowing more of a known carcinogen into our lives is unacceptable. Our thrust needs to be in the direction of prevention, preventing additional stressors of any type, hazardous, radioactive, to the best we can. And the point with nuclear power is that it's not needed. It doesn't do 
what is being touted. It can't come online in time. It takes money away from real options. It perpetuates a system that uh, encourages waste and ignoring the sustainable uh, needs of our planet. So it's best if we use our energy to find the other alternatives that are actually right before us and that we do acknowledge that what we've created is a problem and we're going to have to put energy and money and expertise into managing it. We can't deny it. So the report that we just did, out of control, on purpose, the dispersal of radioactive waste into landfills and consumer products, is uh, talking about ways that nuclear waste is being disregarded, it's being removed from regulatory controls and allowing uh, radioactive, known radioactive materials to be dispersed into regular trash, sold into recycling. We looked mostly at uh, how it gets out uh, by the Department of Energy, the mechanisms that the Department of Energy uses to uh, convince itself and us that it's okay to not take care of the waste that was created from the nuclear bomb production. We know that the nuclear power industry has been uh, trying to get its radioactive waste deregulated, released, pretend it's not radioactive, uh, treated as not radioactive, and given away or sold into commerce for decades. The Department of Energy has also been uh, wanting to save money and sell it off or give it away or reuse it as not radioactive, but common law is that we don't take nuclear waste and disperse it. Common law, what people generally expect of government is that if we've got an industry or a weapons program, nuclear weapons program that's creating waste, that the goal of our government would be to isolate that waste and to prevent its release into our rivers and into our consumer goods. That's the common expectation of government. That is common law. You don't put poisons into the common. So we don't necessarily have a law that says it's illegal to put this stuff into your baby toys or your regular garbage dump. But that's the expectation that we have of our government. Because the government tried to actually legalize putting nuclear waste into regular garbage, that is deregulating it, sending it into regular trash, or selling it into metal recycling, which the metal industry fought hard and has been somewhat successful in preventing, um, into plastics, into concrete, soil reuse. The things that get contaminated from nuclear power and weapon sites uh, it's the same kind of garbage we have all around us, except that it's got plutonium in it, it's got strontium, it's got cesium and radioiodines. So the government would like to save money and send it into places that regular garbage goes. Since it costs so much and it's so difficult to detect, they can get away with this, if not chased after. So what I've been trying to do is look at how the nuclear power industry and how the nuclear weapons complex justifies to itself what kind of rules it's made for itself that enable it to let go or to give away or to remove control from the nuclear waste that they've generated. What people can do to stop the nuclear waste from nuclear power and weapons from being let go from being released into regular trash, into recycling, is to make sure that our elected officials know that it's going on. It's not something that we easily believe that our government would allow known radioactive waste to be dispersed. So if people don't want nuclear waste being dumped in regular trash or being recycled, we're going to have to make sure that those that we elect that have control over the agencies that license the waste makers know that we know what's going on and we want to stop it. Uh, it's going to take letters, it's going to take public education, um, letters to the editor, but direct meetings and calls to our elected officials 
to tell them among the many things that we need to be telling them these days that we have to continue to keep track of the waste from nuclear nuclear power in particular because there's such a push to make new nuclear power. Anybody that thinks that nuclear power is an option needs to tell us what, <laughs> what they think about using nuclear waste from nuclear power in things that surround us every day or that are dumped into regular trash dumps that eventually leak into our water that we drink. Write to Congress, check out your own landfill, check out whether it's happening in your community. If you're in a state that has nuclear power or nuclear weapons facilities, or if you're in the state of Tennessee, which has the most companies that are licensed to process nuclear waste, although there are other states, Pennsylvania, California, that have companies that do some middleman role with the nuclear waste, you need to find out whether this is happening. And so it'll take a little bit of research and a little bit of uh, assertiveness to make sure that regulators know you're on top of it. The regulators, as they call themselves, those who license the nuclear facilities in our states, they would like to remove more waste from their purview and so by picking a number, a measurable number, below which they don't have to regulate, that's less that they have to deal with. And unfortunately, uh, they, they should have to deal with it. And if they don't like dealing with it, then they need to help stop the creation of it, stop licensing nuclear reactors and other facilities that generate the stuff. We need to stop wasting time and discussion on nuclear power. If people want to consider that, they can do the research. But I'd like to move on in the discussion and look at what the real answers are. And change the system to allow for sustainable and um, efficient use of, of energy.